Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Maybe just ask everyone to take their seats and we'll get started. So good evening. My name's uh, Tom Stelfox. I'm an ICU uh, physician and scientific director of the O'Brien Institute for Public Health at the uh, University of Calgary. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's uh, town hall conversation around Alberta 2023 health system challenges and opportunities. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, tonight's event is taking place in the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. It includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika Nation, the Ghani, and the Kainai First Nation, the Tsutsina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Tonight's event is brought to you by the Center for Health Policy. It's housed within the O'Brien Institute for Public Health at the University of Calgary. The O'Brien Institute is a research institute at the university. It's got just over a thousand members that span all of the major faculties at the university. And it aims to function as sort of the interface of society and science. So that society can bring some of its thorny questions to the scientists who can then do research, create new knowledge, share it back with society to then hopefully make informed decisions. I want to thank Gail and David O'Brien, our naming uh, donors, without whom tonight's event wouldn't be possible. Uh, they're not only inspiring philanthropists, but they're dedicated champions of public health. I'd like to thank the Calgary Public Library for allowing us to, uh, to spend our time together here in this beautiful facility. I've got two housekeeping issues. Um, first is emergency exits. So in the event of an emergency, you've got two choices. You can go back up the stairs and out the front door, or you can come down the stairs and through here and out to the left. In terms of washrooms, they're back up the stairs out into the main hallway. So our topic tonight um, is nothing less than the future of healthcare in Alberta. It's not a small topic. Um, it's a top priority for Albertans. And when we speak to Albertans, what we hear is they're worried. And that's not surprising. We've just come through a pandemic. Um, our health system, like many around the world, have gone through tremendous strain. Um, and what they tell us is they're worried about access. Can I get access to a family doctor? What happens if I go to the emergency department? They're worried about the quality of care when they do get access. Is it going to be of high quality? And then they're worried, is this all sustainable? Will this be there in the future? Will this be there for my children? The Center for Health Policy tackles these types of thorny issues. It does so by bringing researchers together with clinicians, government officials, and community leaders. An example of this is earlier this spring, the Center launched a series of health issue briefs. It went to Albertans to find out what are the key issues for them from a health care perspective. And the issues they told us about, which we turned into issue briefs, were primary care reform, aging and seniors care, youth mental health, the future of Alberta health services, and how do we care for our citizens um, who live in more rural and remote areas. And so we're very fortunate tonight to have the five lead authors of those briefs have a conversation with you. Now, since we plan this event, uh, we find ourselves into an election. And so it's really important for me to be clear with you that the Center for Health Policy, the O'Brien Institute, and the University of Calgary is nonpartisan. That we don't endorse any candidate um, or individual. And that all of our members here tonight are here as members of the public. Our goal is to have a thoughtful conversation with you. Health and health care is too important to be partisan. We really need all Albertans to understand these issues and then to help us identify solutions to the challenges and ways to take advantage of the opportunities. Now, our goal is a conversation, but that's not practical with a number of people in the room. So we're going to ask you to submit questions. And you can do it two ways. The first is you can use your phone or tablet with a camera feature to zoom in on the QR code up on the slides there, tap on the link, and that'll allow you to ask questions or like questions. If you're like me and like older technology, well, then what we've got is we've got ushers who are to walk around with cue cards, um, and you can write your question down, um, put your hand up, they'll come to you, and then they'll enter the question for you. 
And so with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator. We're very fortunate to have Ken Lima Coelho, um, who's CEO and president of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Calgary. He's an experienced moderator. Um, he's a dedicated community builder. And we're really looking forward to having the opportunity of having a community building conversation about the future of healthcare in Alberta. So please join me in welcoming Ken. All right, welcome everybody. How's everybody? Can you hear me okay? I'm gonna level with you. We've had a bit of a bumpy ride on our sound check today. So if for some reason you're in the back and it starts being a little tricky, just let flag one of us, let me know, and then we can fix that. Uh, but you know, beautiful library. Every once in a while there are gremlins in the system, but we'll, we'll get past it. Uh, Tom, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, you know, I'm a kid of immigrant parents and my mom and dad vowed to themselves that one day I would be a doctor. At least now I can stand beside five of them. Close enough, mom and dad. Uh, you know, um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters, just to let you know, we're a mentoring organization. We are an organization that helps young people facing adversity connect in with trusted adult or teen mentors to give them a better path. But as, uh, as, as Tom Stelfox mentioned, my, uh, my jam is community. I love creating conversations between people, and I also love uh, my university. The O'Brien Institute for Public Health, housed at the University of Calgary, is an important conversation starter. But today, we're all citizens. We get to have a great conversation about a very important topic, our healthcare system and our own health. I was chatting with uh, Dr. Tom Noseworthy earlier. You'll meet him in a minute, and he told me 41 to 42 percent of our provincial budget is this line item. So it really matters to have a conversation, a robust conversation, and that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, as Tom, there's many Toms. As Dr. Stelfox mentioned, uh, a couple of ways in on those, on, on those questions, the QR code or the old school technology, but shh, you, you need to know that I'm gonna be the curator of the questions. They're coming in a variety of ways, but to keep the conversation flowing, it isn't the first question you see on your app or all that, it's, it's where I wanna take the conversation based on what you uh, put your energy and attention to. But we've got some great speakers, and let's get on to it. First, uh, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Aaron Johnston. Interesting cat. He's the emergency medicine physician who's worked all over the place, uh, British Columbia, Nunavut, Northwest Territories, Alberta. He's an expert in physician training programs and the delivery of care in rural regions. Rural regions is hard to say. I hope he does better than I did. Larry, uh, everyone, Dr. Aaron Johnston. All right, thanks everybody, and thank you for that introduction. Rural anything is fairly hard to say. Um, and I want, to, uh, I want to start off by, like why are we talking about rural in front of an urban crowd? And it's because rural matters to all Albertans. Many of us, whether we live in an urban place or a rural place, are connected to our rural surroundings. We spend time recreating or visiting friends and family in rural regions. Many of us are originally from rural regions, and some of us hope to retire in rural areas of Alberta. And so this is an important uh, issue for all Albertans. The issue is that Alberta, Alberta is experiencing an accelerating loss of rural physicians, especially in rural areas. Although 22% of people live outside of the Calgary-Edmonton corridor, only 7% of our family physicians uh, live and work in those com same communities. And this has big impacts. It means that rural patients have a hard time accessing health care. It means that rural economies, which are primarily driven by safety-sensitive industries like resources, agriculture, and energy, are unsupported in rural regions and sometimes have a hard time getting initiatives started because they're not proximal to the necessary health care. Uh, rural teaching capacity, which is what I spend a lot of my time doing, how do we train the rural health workforce of the future for rural Alberta, in rural Alberta, is increasingly difficult to do. As there are fewer physicians, the access side of it, patients have a hard time seeing physicians, we see that in the university in the training side of it. Those same physicians are fewer in number to take our trainees out in rural Alberta to inspire them about rural careers. And as rural doctors, rural nurses work more and more to try to keep their communities going, they risk burnout, moving from working what is 1.0 FTE to 1.1 to 1.2 FTE. And for all Albertans, rural and urban, as the rural healthcare access crisis worsens, 
that rural health care moves into urban spaces and makes urban people's access to health care more challenging because there's more demand for those urban services. We have to act now because without, without action, the, this will only worsen. There's nothing that will magically fix itself in this space. Rural health care systems are, are webs, they're not silos. And so the care that's delivered in rural communities is integrated. And it means that the loss of a single person, maybe the doctor who does obstetrics in that community, or a nurse who's experienced in the OR, can have calamitous and cascading effects. As the OR capacity is lost, obstetric capacity is lost, and then your anesthesia providers leave rural communities, and that leaves the emergency room with less support. And soon enough, you end up with communities that have a hard time delivering even basic care, never mind robust care. There has to be options, though, and there are. This is not a Calgary or Alberta-only problem, and so this is a problem people around the world are working on, and there's great options to do better in this space. Number one, we need to focus on building rural health teams that are able to deliver a wide range of services required by communities. Most of the time, rural people should be able to access most services fairly close to home. And we know that hospitals and health systems in rural communities that are robust, they offer a wide variety of different services, are more resilient because there's cross coverage and ability to take up the slack when something predictable does happen to the workforce. Number two, we need to focus on rural practice models that promote workforce durability. For too long in Alberta, we've relied on a system of having the bare minimum number of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and others in rural communities to run services. And when one person leaves for a maternity leave, a paternity leave, due to illness uh, or due to retirement, it can sometimes throw the whole community into disarray. We need practice models that are robust, that have enough, uh, enough healthcare workforce in the community, and attract new graduates. We know that healthcare workers who, who have the time as part of their life to integrate into community life, whether it's uh, running clubs, being part of community-based organizations, being a mom or dad who takes their kids to school and w maybe coaches their kids' sports, those physicians stay in communities because they become part of the community. Where physicians who are just asked to work 100 hours a week more and more, they don't integrate into the community and they're much higher risk to leave. Number three, we need to educate the rural health workforce of the future with rural teachers and in rural communities. Our rural residency programs have great success. 70% of the graduates of those, of those programs stay and work in rural Alberta versus about 5% of those who are trained in urban training programs. So those training programs are successful, but they're small. We need to find ways to expand them. So why act now? Because if we stay the course, things will only get worse. They'll get worse for rural Albertans, but they'll get worse for all Albertans. We have the option of taking a small step, doing things that might have stabilizing influence on the system to keep things where they are right now. But I'd challenge us to be bold, because I think we're good at that as Albertans, to take this on as a challenge and to say, let's move into being a leader in this space. Let's find innovative and dynamic solutions that will help us and we can also share with other communities around the world that are experiencing the same problems. Thank you very much for your time tonight. All right, thanks, Aaron. So remember, these are just bite-sized tastes of a lifetime of work. You will have an opportunity to ask questions and we can deep dive into any of the various topics or even cross-pollinate those topics as we, we keep rolling. All right, let's talk about seniors. Dr. Jaina holroyd Leduc is a geriatrician and researcher. She's an expert in advancing the care of the elderly. We were chatting earlier. She's lived all over this country. She's lived in the United States and she really cares about this topic. So let's hear it for Dr. Jaina. Here she comes. Good evening, everyone. So today I'm going to focus on um, continuing care and supporting a population living in continuing care. Um, just to give you a definition, continuing care includes long-term care, it includes supported living, lodges, any facility-based um, living for older adults. So why do we need to rethink our continuing care structure that we currently have? Well, the Alberta population is rapidly aging, similar to the rest of Canada. One in five Albertans is going to be over 65 by 2035, so in a little over 10 years. 
Many of these older adults are going to experience declining health related to chronic illness. In medicine, we've been very good at increasing life expectancy and addressing acute illness, which has actually resulted in creating a number of chronic illnesses that people will live with for a number of years to decades. So as we age, we tend to uh, accumulate more and more illnesses, which can also result in increasing frailty, or in other words, increasing dependency on others for activities of daily living. Remaining at home for as long as possible is a goal for many, or arguably most. However, it's not always an option for all, given the increasing needs of support and the safety to manage day to day. This makes, means taking action now to better support the well-being of continuing care is important. We need to focus on ensuring high quality of care for all um, who live in continuing care. So I'm going to focus on three key strategies around rethinking continuing care. First one is we need to implement equitable pay and adequate staffing. And I think the COVID pandemic helped highlight this very clearly for everyone um, in, in Canadian society. Basically, we need by um, providing equitable pay and adequate staffing, we'll be able to support resident-centered care, which means we can have increased opportunities for meaningful interaction and activities, which will help enhance the quality of life as we age. As well, it will support a more optimal work environment, allowing those that work in and continuing care to have better work-life integration, particularly for the healthcare aides who are the lowest paid within the continuing care workforce, who are often racialized women and who are providing the day-to-day -day care. So it's important that we currently um, make sure that we're adequately paying and giving them adequate supports. As well, with adequate pay and adequate staffing, we'll attract more people to the workforce, which is going to require growth. So we'll need sufficient workforce to, to make sure we have enough funded continuing care um, spaces as our population ages. And it will help ensure that we um, are positioned to provide high quality care for residents. The second strategy is focusing on building um, and care delivery innovations that support a home-like environment while also meeting residents' care needs from a healthcare and functional perspective. Basically, we need to develop new standards for building and room designs, as well as for the outdoor spaces for, that older adults live in um, when they're dealing with frailty. This requires consulting human factors engineers, architects, and environmental designs, and investing in initiatives um, to evolve industry standards and update building guidelines to better meet the needs of our aging population. We also need to reward operators of continuing care facilities that are incorporating best evidence into practice by creating public recognition programs, incentivizing them to provide high quality evidence-based care. We also need to support evaluation and incorporation of technology within continuing care, but in a very meaningful way, using something called positive technology, which is designed specifically to support the well-being of older adults. And this third strategy is increasing the number and the quality of continuing care spaces. One goal would be for a provincial target of 29 or more beds per 1,000 population over 65, which is the current Canadian average. In Alberta, we're right now below the current Canadian average at only 26, be 26 beds per 1,000 population over 65. We need to invest in new and progressive continuing care models that are innovative and think outside the box and promote a home-like environment. We need to also consider the, promoting the purchasing of long-term care insurance, which may be needed to reduce the needed public dollars um, that over time are going to be less as our taxpayer base decreases as our population ages. So overall, we need to consider three things. There needs to be immediate investment in innovative building and care delivery models. As I said, in about 10 years, our population, one in, four, one in five, to upwards of one in four, is going to be over 65. We need to cha make changes in employment practices to better balance quality of life and quality of care with safety. And now is really the time for this investment in the entire sector in order to support a rapidly aging Alberta and overall Canadian population. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jaina. Moving right along, we're going to now hear, uh, this one is dear to my heart, running a children's charity in Calgary, especially one that 
uh, supports is a bit of a, a midstream mitigation against mental health effects in young people. I'm really looking forward to what uh, Dr. Paul Arnold has to say. He's a child and adolescent uh, psychiatrist and researcher, an expert in developing and testing early treatments for children, adolescents, and emerging adults with anxiety, depression, and other common health, uh, mental health disorders. Dr. Paul Allen, uh, Arnold, here we come. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. So yeah, I'm going to be focusing on recommendations for a comprehensive youth mental health strategy in Alberta. And this is really the, the work of a, a group of us who are you know, passionate about improving youth mental health in Alberta and, and uh, really coming from a, a range of disciplines, and including consulting with, with people with lived experience. Um, so first of all, we, we do have a crisis in youth mental health, as, as many of you may be aware. Uh, certainly the pandemic kind of brought it to the forefront, but really what has happened in the last few years is really exacerbating some pre-existing trends that we were seeing in youth mental health. So we know that 70% of mental illness begins before the age of 18, uh, with only 20% of those who de uh, develop mental illness receiving effective evidence-based care. Uh, and there are a number of barriers to receiving effective treatment. So first of all, uh, we have a fragmented care system when it comes to mental health. We have long wait lists. Uh, there are ways of assessing mental health illness severity, but they, they're not really standardized and they're not uh, typically implemented uh, very uh, evenly across the spectrum, across the continuum of care. And we have a lack of incentives to provide treatment with best evidence. So we end up getting, depending on where you go, you, you end up getting different, different care at times. Uh, so uh, there is a history in Alberta of uh, trying to address this with um, various uh, strategies that have come out over the years uh, or sort of, and reports that have come out over the last few years. So first of all, in 2015 to 2017, there was a, uh, a valuing mental health report which recommended developing a comprehensive mental health strategy. Um, and then after that time, uh, we as I mentioned, between 2020 and now, we noticed that there was a decline in youth mental health, incre an increase in substance use. Now, again, coinciding with the pandemic, but uh, really an exacerbation of pre-existing trends, which suggested that we that something was wrong, that the, the needs weren't being met. And in fact, in 2022, the Auditor General reported that most elements of a mental health strategy as proposed in previous reports, including the Value Mental Health Report, uh, had not yet uh, been implemented. And admittedly, this is a very complex uh, issue in a complex landscape. Um, one aspect of this that maybe hasn't been adequately addressed is that any strategy that we use for mental health really needs to be patient-centered. So uh, youth, and in the case of youth mental health, youth and families need to be engaged and able to make key decisions. So not just not just consulted, but really integrally involved in the work. Um, and another key piece to this is that the engagement needs to include outreach to marginalized groups. So we kind of have that as a starting point for developing a comprehensive uh, youth mental health strategy. Um, and we've, we've identified uh, three different priority areas that need to be part of the, such a strategy. So f the first priority area is equity. So we need to have equitable access to care uh, by, and uh, there's a number of ways of doing that. Some of it takes advantages of technological developments, but it's also about meeting, uh, meeting youth and patients where they are. So uh, expanding the opportunities for virtual mental health, um, school-based mental health. We know that many youth actually first access mental health services, first express mental health concerns uh, when uh, in, in the school environment. Um, there are various innovative service models, and one of them is the integrated youth service hub model, uh, in which mental health is provided together with other services, such as physical health services, occupational therapy, linking to community agencies, you know, like like Big Brothers and and so forth. Um, we also need better support from tr to transitioning from pediatric to adult systems of care. There's a big drop off in access to services often when one goes from child and adolescent services to adult services, and that needs to be addressed. A second priority area that we've identified is um, really getting a better sense of the quality and the impact of services by uh, standardizing assessments of mental illness and mental health. Um, we have an opportunity in Alberta where we have an integrated um, electronic medical record uh, that Alberta health, um, Alberta health Services has introduced called Connect Care. So there is an opportunity to integrate these assessments province-wide. 
Um, linking, there's another aspect of youth mental health, and maybe a little bit different than other areas of health, and perhaps a bit different even from adult mental health, is that really this is something that needs to involve multiple ministries. I mentioned the fact that you know uh, education is a, a place where youth often first access services, so therefore the Ministry of Education needs to be involved, for example, in developing such a strategy and to be a partner. Um, a third priority area that we've identified is just increasing the value of services uh, by providing incentives for delivery of best practices. And that can be a range of incentives of, um, of both financial and non-financial. One way of doing that is looking at effective services that can be delivered efficiently and by a range of practitioners. So one suggestion that we have made is utilizing more trends diagnostic interventions that can be used across the continuum of care. So in conclusion, uh, we propose the need uh, for a comprehensive youth mental health strategy that has three priority areas, increasing access to services, understanding and measuring the impact of services, increasing the value of, of those services, and, uh, and that such a strategy uh, needs to be engaging youth and families who can design solutions alongside clinicians, researchers, and policymakers. Uh, thank you. Great job, Paul, thank you. And yes, I plan to ask you later what transdiagnostic interventions is. I'm here for you, crowd, it's good. Um, Dr. Carrie McBrien, um, she is uh, really practicing at the integration of research and the ground game. Uh, a family physician and a researcher, is also an expert in developing and evaluation, uh, evaluating novel models of primary care. Primary care, that's the stuff we all need all the time. Uh, let's hear it for Dr. Carrie McBrien. stand on my toes. Okay, um, good evening, and thanks for, uh... oh. there we go. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah? All right, uh, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be chatting about uh, primary care and more specifically access to primary care. Um, so, uh, we know that access to good quality primary care uh, is a critical component of a well-functioning healthcare system. However, uh, the services that we have available today in Alberta are not meeting our needs. Uh, one in five adults does not have a family doctor, and of those that do, one in three report that they have challenges uh, getting to their doctor, accessing them, making appointments. Uh, and we have seen recently that more and more people are looking for family doctors. There are more visits to the Alberta Find a Doctor website. Um, but there aren't enough doctors taking patients right now to meet the demand. Uh, so what do we do? Um, if we continue to have challenges with access to primary care, uh, that lack of access will lead to delays in care, uh, which will put pressure on our emergency departments and hospitals and may also potentially lead to poor health outcomes. So we're proposing uh, three ideas to improve access, and I'll speak to each of these in turn. So the first recommendation is around supporting team-based care. And with team-based care, there's shared responsibility for patient care across professionals with specialized skills. These can be dietitians, pharmacists, chronic disease management nurses, in addition to the family doctor, um, but really, people who bring different skills, different um, uh, ways of caring for patients to the table. And by having these robust teams, we can increase capacity uh, for taking and seeing individuals, and we can also increase the quality of care. To get to team-based care, because this does exist in pockets, um, but there's variability in terms of uh, where it's available, and what types of teams are available. Uh, if we want to have this available more broadly across the province, uh, we need real investment to fund teams. Uh, we also need care models that support collaborative, support collaborative care and recognize the non-face-to-face -face work that teams do. And the teams need to be flexible. Uh, they need to be able to adapt to the unique needs of our diverse communities. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. 
to, in, in order to staff the teams that uh, are needed, we also need to enhance recruitment and retention. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a shortage of family doctors. Um, but in addition to family doctors, we need to also be recruiting all of the highly qualified personnel that are required uh, on, to form these robust teams. Uh, incre increasing recruitment and retention requires increased capacity for training, assessment, and certification. Uh, we also need opportunities to practice in well-supported teams. Uh, so recommendation number one is a prerequisite uh, to recommendation number two. And we need competitive compensation. Uh, we're competing with other provinces, with other countries, uh, and in order to attract people and keep them here, uh, we need to have the places for them to practice um, and the models of care and remuneration that will keep them here. And the last thing, uh, the last recommendation I'm going to chat about is supporting innovation and evaluation. Um, and this uh, isn't, wouldn't be an add-on or an afterthought, uh, but really something that's proactively embedded in the way we uh, deliver our care and our services. Evaluation is necessary to know what's working, and what isn't working, and why. And innovation is something that we need to continue to develop and implement because our needs will continue to evolve, technology will evolve and advance, and if we're not looking out for those things, um, we'll be behind the eight ball again. So what do we need for that? We need strong partnerships uh, between our academic institutions, the government, the healthcare system, uh, the frontline care providers, uh, and our citizens and patients. We need investment in data infrastructure and skilled personnel. And we need real integration of innovation and evaluation activities into our care delivery models so that it just becomes something that we do. Frontline clinicians participate, patients participate, uh, and for that we need, um, we need to recognize that it's a part of what we do as health professionals. I'd like to end by looking a little bit ahead beyond just this question of access. Um, because comprehensive primary health care does have important health and economic benefits. If we can provide uh, good comprehensive care across the board, across the province, uh, we can achieve better health equity, better population health outcomes, and a more sustainable health care system overall. So beyond these initial changes and, and critical changes that need to be made to address the issue of access, when we're thinking about those and also thinking you know, where we're going to go after that, I, I'm urging everyone to keep in mind uh, you know, this idea of a healthcare system that's built on a foundation of community-based primary care, where there's universal access to a continuum of continuum of care, everything from health promotion to disease prevention and beyond, uh, as well as treatment, uh, and one that's well integrated both across the system and with other social services and supports. So I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. All right, our last opening sort of gambit and then we will get to the richness of the questions in the audience, is uh, Dr. Tom Noseworthy. I was a journalist for about 15 years with the public broadcaster to the CBC, and Tom had a nickname around the CBC. He was a great talker with no BS. We love Tom, and he's still that guy, I can tell. He's also a piano player. We'll talk about that later. Uh, health policy researcher, health system leader, a retired intensive care physician. In 2007, not surprisingly, and you'll see it on his lapel, he was appointed to the Order of Canada for his ongoing contributions to health policy and Medicare. Some people think he's retired, but he doesn't think so. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tom Noseworthy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to see so many of you. Uh, I want to thank University of Calgary and the O'Brien Institute and Cummings School of Medicine for uh, putting this event together. Uh, it won't be the last time you see the Centre for Health Policy in the forthcoming months. 
Uh, I want to talk about Alberta Health Services, not because I am a politician or because I have a crystal ball, but because I do care about the system that is in our province and it offers, offers care. I um, hope you can see this. It's a little small, but before 1971, it was a free-for-all system with individual hospitals. Um, uh, payment was um, uh, cash on a barrel head. Uh, and by 1971, Al Alberta was the last province to join Canadian Medicare. Kicking and screaming, we came into the fold. From 71 to 95, the system um, stayed pretty well the same. Individual hospitals with their own governance and their management system. And um, there were 229 of those when they were disbanded on the 1st of April, 1995. Uh, and that's when um, I stopped uh, having a hospital CEO's job in Edmonton, and I recall uh, my wonderful time in Edmonton before that. Uh, regional governance came in in 1995 uh, in Alberta, just like it was across many of the Western um, uh, countries, actually, uh, with health systems, and certainly uh, most of the provinces. Uh, and we, uh, we, we went from many uh, regions to fewer regions in 2003. And then in 2008, um, poof, we had Alberta Health Services, which is what I want to talk about tonight. And we've now, we're just coming into the 15th year. Question is, what happens next? Um, it's not necessarily business as usual, because business as usual is a little unusual right now, because our system, our four. $15.5 billion system currently doesn't have a board. It was fired, and it has an official administrator. Uh, woo, that seems a little unstable. So what will happen next? And I don't know, but it's fruit for thought, so read the paper and see what you think. Um, how have we done, though? Because for 15 years, a lot has happened. Uh, Alberta Health Services, in many respects, has been a success story on multiple counts. Uh, you know, we still have now achieved the lowest expense costs for administration in the country, as you would hope and expect. Yet, on the other hand, our cost per inpatient day case uh, is the highest in the country. And if you look down through those numbers, and I apologize if they're hard to see, I've chosen some quality dimensions on the left uh, and the measure in the middle and then where we stand. And we stand high for certain things. Uh, you know, overall uh, hospital experience is considered the best in the country uh, when Albertans are polled in that regard. Um, but in some things, we don't do as well, and we tend to be middle of the pack. Uh, why is that? Well, a lot of reasons, uh, but um, here's, here's some uh, of them for sure. Um, the government of Alberta has never really let Alberta Health Services operate freely and uh, uh, without intervention, and indeed without dwelling on it. There's been, the board has been now fired twice in the 15-year period, uh, and an official administrator put in place, but um, I, I, I don't understand uh, why that happened or its purpose, and I'm not sure where we stand right now. Uh, also, uh, if you work in Alberta Health Services, uh, you may um, be getting frequent calls from Alberta Health, the government's department, uh, that seems to have a, a lot of duplication of function, uh, and indeed, um, uh, some might say, a lot of interference. Uh, there was a task force formed in 2012, which interestingly enough, included the um, former uh, Minister of Health, uh, and I just got to read from this. It's going to be a little tricky because of my eyesight, but nevertheless. The task force learned that prior to, but primarily since 208 structuring of the healthcare delivery system, whereby nine regional health authorities and three provincial organizations were merged into one, confusion about roles and responsibility exists amongst the parties and in the minds of the stakeholders and in Albertans in general. Restructuring has been undertaken in the past without full consideration of the reason the risk, the alternative, and without fully developed implementation strategy. The cumulative effects of restructuring have left the major players in the system stressed and confused about roles and responsibilities. Um, and then physicians. Physicians don't work um, for Alberta Health Services. Uh, sometimes they don't even work with Alberta Health Services. Um, if you want to get a hold of all of Alberta Health Services physicians, you use a fax fan out usually because you don't have their numbers because they're all kept private. Physicians are not aligned with Alberta Health Services, um, and that's a two-sided fence, of course. So what should happen next? Well, there's some options. 
We could go back to the bad old days when I was a hospital CEO and there was 229. The rurals were like that a lot. We'd get closer to the municipal uh, uh, governments and to the local MLAs, but going back to individual hospital uh, organizations and governments could be costly, and I'm not sure it's necessarily the right thing to do, but there's pros and cons. We could go back to the regional model that we enjoyed from 95 to 2008, it seemed to work well. Others have stayed with it in other parts of the country, but note that two other provinces have, heard, have followed Alberta's example and have gone to a single delivery system. So we could go with three and keep AHS as long as we make some necessary changes, because while there has been good consolidation of many different types of services in NHS, uh, less duplication, less fighting between Alberta and uh, in, in terms of Edmonton and Calgary, um, uh, more consolidation of, of non-clinical services, uh, we haven't done that well on the clinical services plan. There is no manpower plan for this province. There's no clinical service plan for the province in, in, in effect. And uh, physicians still are relatively non-aligned. So we could keep AHS but make some changes. And then finally to throw in something completely different that we've never done before, we could set up a board that had sub-boards uh, in acute care, primary care, long-term care, population, public health. Um, there's pros to that, there's cons to it, like an NHS within Alberta as an example, separately legislated and then uh, with those four sub-boards. What's going to happen? I have no idea, but something has got to happen because the system we have right now is in limbo. And when elections occur, watch out, because tax-funded healthcare systems become the political fodder of those that are elected. Thanks. See, promised you a great talker and no BS. Told you. All right. While our panel, these uh, these great uh, individuals are now going to become a panel, I'll ask you to take your seats. And then I'm going to reiterate a little bit of what have I heard. You heard a lot, but what I heard from Aaron is rural challenges equal urban challenges. The, it doesn't just stay out there. Uh, bare minimum is just not good enough on rural medicine anymore. And he challenged us to be bold, which I think is interesting. Uh, Jaina, one in five of us will be over 65 in about a decade's time. That's a lot of people. At home is the goal, but it's not always practical, is what I heard her say. And then continuing care is a real key. So that's something we'll explore. Uh, Paul, he called it a crisis in youth mental health. That's not hyperbole, folks. It's a crisis. Um, engaging youth and families is actually really important in that, in that, in that uh, work. And then looking at those transition times, especially from pediatric to adult, really important. Carrie, one in five of you in this room probably don't have a family doctor. That means a lot and has daily implications for your families. Uh, we need flexible teams, but we also need them to be innovative, I heard. And uh, she also mentioned it's not just about family docs. It's about having the people to support those family docs. My friend, Dr. D. Young, is smiling right now. I see you, D. We went to university together. She did better than I did. Um, and then I heard, well, I heard a lot from Tom, but I heard our system has evolved since the kicking and screaming era, so that's good. $14.5 billion system, one administrator running it. Hmm, interesting. And I heard that there's a parallel push and pull with AHS management and, uh, and uh, Alberta Health. So stay tuned on where that goes. So we heard a lot. What did you think of these great thinkers? <laughs> All right, so here's the fussy business now. I am going to ask uh, questions from the podium here. I'm going to pose a few questions that I've got prepared, but uh, people are holding up cards because they've got a question. We've got our app, of course, the Slido app. If you just zoom your camera in, a little yellow thing will pop up. You can uh, hit that button and you can enter your question digitally from your smartphone right into there. We, we've, got, uh, we've got some time. I left my phone over there. How much time do we have? Can you bring that to me? Everyone, this is Leslie. She does what I ask. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. So we've got about 45 minutes for questions, which is great. And we're going to take, um, what I need to do is pull up this fancy gizmo here to see your questions. But to start, I'm going to pose a question to everybody on the panel and just take a, a minute or so to answer it. Uh, we heard a lot about what are the challenges are and some solutions, of course. But let's start with the positive. We always tell the kids we serve, let's 
do a strength-based approach. So shine a light from your different perspectives on actually what's going right where, uh, where it comes to your discipline or your, your focus in Alberta Health. What's going right? Just give us one thing. And maybe we'll start with Jaina. You've all got a mic. We'll start with Jaina, and I'll fiddle with some buttons. So I think uh, a couple things are going right when it comes to um, care for older uh, adults in Alberta. One is um, Alberta actually has a very robust home care service. Um, we actually provide um, some of the uh, most uh, home care services out of uh, any province. Um, so we, um, older adults can get up to four hours a day, which um, is a lot higher than other provinces. So that, that is, is helpful at um, helping people to manage their care needs and to remain at home as long as possible. Um, the other thing I think that the pandemic uh, showed is the fact that our um, uh, continuing care is linked to acute care. It's, it's linked to Alberta Health Services. So there weren't the issues that we saw in other provinces, particularly in Ontario and Quebec, in terms of making sure that continuing care had um, needed PPE or that there was good um, working relationship between acute care and continuing care and managing um, you know, outbreaks and, and, and managing services. The AHS is well connected um, with our continuing care. Uh, unlike, for example, Ontario, um, the continuing care um, sector actually falls under seniors' health. It's not even under their um, their Ministry of Health, or at least it, it hasn't been. So um, I think those are two very good strengths um, to a system as our population is aging. Who wants to go next? Tom, what's going well in AHS? Well, uh, I've had 42 wonderful years in Alberta, and I have a lot for which to be thankful in that regard. Um, I, I do care about the health system here. Um, even though I live in BC right now, I actually come to Alberta to get my health care, you know. So uh, there you go. Um, I, I, I'll come off the fence. There's some options as to what should happen next. But I, I happen to think that Alberta Health Services, despite the difficult birth and early years, I think it's moving in the right direction. And I think it needs to be preserved. The fundamental structure should be kept in place. There's some uh, obvious uh, uh, and necessary changes that were required. So I think AHS is right for Alberta, and it needs to be given the latitude to operate. All right. Paul. Yeah, I think I would highlight one thing in terms of what's going well, and I think that's the progressive destigmatization of mental health broadly and youth mental health in particular. So a decade ago, uh, we were talking about um, bringing mental health out of the shadows, and that would have been a big focus uh, of this of a panel or a talk like this. Um, mental health was referred to as the orphan of healthcare, and youth mental health as the orphan's orphan. I think that's changing. Um, I think that again, the fact that we're having this conversation today, and there is so much focus and prioritization of youth mental health is probably, and that we're able to talk about it, uh, is probably the, the most positive aspect of, of uh, in, in this area. Thanks, Paul. Aaron, any bright spots in, uh, in rural health? Yeah, there's lots of bright spots in rural health, but the one I'll choose to highlight is rural education. Um, we have amazing educational programs in Alberta that allow people in medical school or during residency after medical school to not only go to rural Alberta and have an experience, but actually to embed themselves in a community and spend most of their training there, getting to know the community, getting to become part of the community, and ultimately most of them choosing that as a career path for themselves. And the communities that they're in are bright spots as well because they tend to be the communities where rural healthcare is working where there is good team-based care, where there is access to family doctors in their clinics, where there is hospitals that offer a good range of services that really serve the community's needs at large. And so uh, from my point of view, there's a lot of strength in rural Alberta. And part of it is recognizing that strength and thinking about how did that happen in that community? And how can we leverage that knowledge to build something good in communities that are really struggling? Great, great answer. Carrie, uh, can't it all be bad in primary care? What's going well? So no, it's not all bad in primary care. And you know, Aaron provided some examples of, of where things are going well. And so there are, you know, places and pockets of innovation uh, where team-based care has really grown and flourished. Um, the primary care networks have been supporting uh, primary care practices with additional supports and uh, are now looking towards a bit more of a population-based uh, model and delivery of services. So there are, there's movement and there are examples of, 
uh, great things that are happening. It's just a matter of making these more widespread. All right, thank you. That, that was the opening gambit. Now we've got questions curated right from this fine audience. Remember, I'm sort of picking and choosing and making things uh, try to flow. So uh, if you're mad, be mad at me later. All right. Um, actually, let's start with you, Jaina. This is a very simple question, and it actually nods to something you mentioned. The, the, this uh, poster wants to know, doesn't long-term care insurance already exist? So what's the status of that right now? Yes, so you can purchase long-term care um, insurance. I just think it's not, unlike other forms of insurance that people um, widely have, you know, such as extended health or life insurance um, or even um, chronic illness insurance, long-term care insurance is, is sort of less well-known and, and less popular, so it's not... Um, uh, you know, utilized or, or purchased by as many. And it, it, by no means is it the answer. It just is an option to help to offset um, the potential um, decrease in, in taxpayer um, funding base. Um, being mindful, though, too, that not everyone will be able to afford long-term care insurance. So we have to, if we're go going to go with this, this strategy, it does have to be a, um, done in a meaningful way. But it is, is, is something we should be looking at and, and probably... Um, people should be considering it as, a, as fundamentally as they would consider other forms of, of insurance. All right, thank you for that answer. This is one for, for Paul. Uh, this uh, poster writes, much of child and youth mental health care, uh, this says, uh, is centralized at the children's hospital or some of these you know, big hubs. How can it be decentralized? And maybe the extension to that question is, should it be more decentralized? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I do think there is a benefit in decentralizing uh, care and having care along a continuum. So that's partly why we sort of refer to this as a comprehensive strategy for, for youth mental health. Uh, there are some examples of that. Uh, so for example, in Calgary, uh, the um, there's a new community-based mental health center, uh, the Summit, um, which is, again, very closely affiliated with the Children's Hospital, but is uh, in but in the community, it's not a hospital building. Yeah, there's not a hospital ER that you go to. There's a walk-in service. So it has a very different feel to it. Um, there's also uh, there another model that's early stages, but there's some positive developments in Alberta is the development of integrated youth hubs, um, which I mentioned very briefly in my presentation. Again, where mental health care is offered, but it tends to be in an accessible community setting, often co-located with other kinds of services health and other services, community agencies and so forth. So although I, again, having said that, I've worked most of my career in a hospital setting. I think there is a value to hospital setting for inpatient care, for sometimes more subspecialized type of care. I do think that more decentralization is beneficial. All right, thanks. Now, in any moderation, live and in person, especially during election, there's always a, a landmine or two. We're about to step on them, folks. Uh, this can be for anybody on the panel, but I think Tom will go first. <laughs> How does private health care practice support the challenges we're now facing? That's a very big conversation in our community. What would you say? What would any of you say? <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, Tom, I did ask you to go first. So. Okay, well, I don't think anybody... Uh would be surprised by my position that I am a strong supporter of publicly funded healthcare systems. Uh, that said, um, be careful though. <laughs> um, publicly funded healthcare systems is not what the Canada Health Act says, and of course, um, our system is built off the Medicare Act of 1966, not the Canada Health Act. Um, when we look at the five principles, um, I think access is important. I think access is important without pain. Um, when you look at the public part of our system, it says in Can Health Act, public administration. Uh, it doesn't say public funding. Let me lump them together, if I might, because you get public funding, public administration. We kind of got that in our country right now, and there's not too many leaks in the system, but it's getting uh, now uh, an issue as to whether or not we should have so-called more private care. I am against more privately funded care for medically necessary services. Against more privately funded care for medically necessary services. Because if nothing else, the legislation for Medicare and the Canada Health Act says that. 
straightforward. I think it's wide open what we do hmm. about um, private delivery. I, I know now that the arguments are starting to mount, and I've made them myself about there's, uh, at some point, private delivery uh, can uh, have adverse effects that nullify the benefit of private funding. Keep private funding, because that keeps management control. How it gets delivered? Well, you know, I think that there's room for expansion of privately delivered services that are publicly funded. I happen, this is not an ad, but I happen to think that one of the finest ophthalmologic centers in Canada is right here in Calgary, the Southern uh, Calgary Eye Center. Uh, that's a group of ophthalmologists. It's a privately funded center, and they do publicly funded work. It's exceptionally good. They cut you off, apparently. <laughs> exceptionally good. So there's room for <laughs> privately delivered, publicly funded services. I think there's a whole debate and discussion about how that might work, and I know it raises issues uh, in those fans for Medicare that can't see any alternative way we have now, uh, but more private funding in our system, uh, if properly managed, uh, is, in my mind, something to look at. I knew Tom didn't need the mic. That's, uh, we're going we're gonna to check in on that mic, but if, if he needs to share around. I wanna, I wanna, it's working again. Back. I want to drill down a little bit more. Um, one of the posters says, one of the people in this room said, where does increasing privatization fit into incentivizing and compensation? That came up a few times in various capacities. Does anyone want to talk about where privatization or, or extension of that you know, um, uh, private delivery where does that factor into some of the, the, the needs for incentivizing and compensating? Somebody want to take that, Aaron? Sure, I can, I can maybe answer that. Remember when you're in a rural community and you see a building that says Physician Associates of Drumheller or something like that, that that's a private office. It's a privately run business where physicians deliver care and, and bill the public payer for those services. And across rural Alberta, other than in hospital care, the vast majority of, of care that's given in the community is delivered in settings like that. And so private care isn't in and of itself an evil or, or something that we need to be scared of. It's, it's already here and it's always been here. But what we lack, and I'm speaking about rural now, is the flexibility to allow physicians who are working and running those private care enterprises in their communities to expand into teams, to have payment models that are dynamic and allow them to hire and, and manage a workforce that can deliver the, the, the services that a community needs. Because most of the time they're stuck in a very, uh, a very narrow fee-for-service model where the physician is paid for seeing a patient on a per-service basis. And that doesn't allow them the flexibility to hire a nurse practitioner who does diabetes management, or a dietitian, or a pharmacist, or anyone else who does those teams. So, so we have lots of great examples of privately run clinics across rural Alberta that are there, billing the public system, but the way we incentivize them doesn't match up with community need in a meaningful way. All right, thank you for that answer. I'm gonna start with uh, Carrie on this next question, and then hop over to, G over to Jana, but feel free to jump in if you have something to say. Teams-based care was mentioned a lot. You just mentioned it, Aaron. Um, what promotes it and what prevents it? And how do we foster that? Let's try uh, start with you. you. You talked about it, Carrie. Teams-based, what makes that happen? What makes that go so that it's a meaningful part of the solution that you were seeking? So I, I think there are a couple of things. One Aaron touched on was the, you know, one of the things that can promote it or hinder it is the way we pay. So if we're paying on a fee-for-service basis where the requirement is that the physician sees a patient in order to bill, then it's more difficult to take those payments and to hire a bunch of team members, right? So uh, one thing we need to think about is how we pay or how teams are paid, and there are you know, different options out there uh, that make it easier uh, to hire and, and have the teams. Uh, the second is recognizing uh, the, the collaboration that can happen with teams, so the professionals that are working together, um, creating good working relationships and understanding each other's strengths um, is another important thing, so that it's not, it's never a one-person show, it's, it's a team. 
And then the third thing is, uh, you know, our, our citizens or our, our patients' expectations of when they come, as, you know, go to see their primary care team. Are they there to see their family doctor and only their family doctor, or are they recognizing that, hey, maybe today I don't need to see the doctor because I'm going to get what I need from somebody else? Um, so I think that a lot of it has to do with changing the expectation of the public uh, to understand what is, what is primary care. And it's, it's not just seeing your family doctor when you need to see them. It's, it's understanding that there's a whole team there now behind them. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. One of the other questioners really wanted to drill down on that. It's usually centered in the physician. That's what everybody, but it could be a nurse. It could be some other practitioner that's actually part of the solution for that patient on that day. So thanks for referring to that. Uh, Jaina, um, this question's for you, but uh, others can comment. Keeping more people in their homes, this questioner asks, means providing home care in different ways. What suggestions do you have? We know that sometimes um, um, uh, you know, care in, in facilities and other things uh, is an outcome or is an inevitability, but how do we keep people in their homes in a better way? Um, so a, a few thoughts. One thing, though, to, to um, an interesting study came out a few years from, I think it was from the US, that actually showed um, the likelihood of remaining home was directly related to how many daughters and daughter-in-laws you have. So those of you that can, can arrange to have more daughters and daughter-in-laws, that's a good strategy. Um, <laughs> She's only <laughs> half kidding. But. Um, so no, we, we, when we're providing care in, in the home, it is very much um, a, a team-based approach. And so um, you know the, the even good home care um, preserve, um, services that are provided um, you know, by our, our public health care system um, are limited, right? There's no ability. We don't. We we cannot, from a, a cost um, model, provide 24/7 care from using public dollars. So, um, you know, it, uh, and and sometimes we do reach that need of meaning 24 24/7 supervision. So it's usually a combination of um, family caregivers, um, paid private caregivers, and and um, our public home care system that that people um, rely on to varying varying degrees. Um, the you know the issues. Are, um, it's it's very very much um, person person dependent. What 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 medical issues are they dealing with? Are they dealing with cognitive impairment? What functional needs do they have, and can those functional needs be met? What's their actual home environment in terms of their ability to access and do day to day functioning? And you know, um, you know is going to is going to drive our ability to, to stay at to stay at home. Um, so so highly variable. Um, but but ultimately, um, you know, not that I don't disagree with staying at home, but part of me sort of thinks. Why do we say I don't want to go to long-term care? Why do I I don't want to go to continuing care? To me, I I think we need to to flip that and say why aren't we making um, continuing care because we know a certain percentage are going to need that care because they won't be able to have the 24/7 care at home that they're going to need. They can't afford it. That's not available. So why are we not making continuing care facilities someplace people want to be? Someplace where you can have meaningful end of life gives you opportunities to engage with um, you know cohort your with um, your own cohort with others with um, you know innovation technology like you know. I think um, for, for years we've looked at um, the you know smart homes, smart smart condos, smart hospital beds. We need to now start thinking about the same thing in continuing care, and and really start thinking about how how do we use um, you know great innov innovation and technology and actually make it a place where. It, you know that that's where I'm going to live the end of my my life, and it's going to be high quality, and I'm going to get good care, and and that and you know why should that not also be something that we're striving for, um, because li living at home it, it does not guarantee good quality of care either if you don't have the supports that you need. So I'm not sure if I answered the question. No, that was that was good. Thank you. And um, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to go backwards. Go backwards. I, I got to go back to the team-based care because I don't want people to be left with an impression that team-based care is a subject specific to and solely for primary care. Mm. Um, I'm a retired ICU physician. I've never looked after a patient by myself in my life. I can't. I, I have a team and I'm a member of that team and play a critical role within it. Um, that's true now for um, virtually all of medicine. The day is gone where individual doc, individual patient, till death do us part. Hey, it's not that way. What should it be like or where can it go? Uh, Team-based care uh, with a physician centrally placed within that team, of course, um, and then not individual care for that person from one person, but from the team, and it's personalized care. 
Give me what I need, not just what a doctor can provide. Mm. Thank you, Tom. That's well, a, well, and also, uh, as a geriatrician from team-based care, I, I think also the family family <coughs> is part of the team, right? And we can't forget that the family is a key part of the team. So learning how to actually, and, th and there's been a lot of work done um, you know, in Alberta around looking at how to actually um, engage the family into, into care for, for older adults. Um, you know, and, and also thinking, you know, innovatively in terms of, um, I think as a geriatrician, you know, we always thought we, we need to send care in to do, um, somebody in, some professional in to do the day-to-day -day care, you know, and if someone's in home or in the facility. But, you know, often it's actually the family member that knows the person, particularly if it's someone living with dementia that knows the person best, knows how to provide their personal care. And so actually maybe what home care should be is somebody to come in to empty the dishwasher, to do the laundry, to shovel, shovel the driveway so that the actual family member who's part of the team can actually provide the personal care and that sort of flies in the face of what we traditionally think of home care, right? Home care is often based on they have to be providing personal care to that one individual or it's not actually home care. So, um, you know, I, I reflected when I, when I had my last child, my mother-in-law wanted to come and help me. And when I, my idea was, well, she's going to come and she's going to do the dishwasher and she's going to do my laundry and she's going to make the meals so I can look after the baby. And all she wanted to do was look after the baby. It's like... <laughs> You know, so it's it's not dissimilar when you're looking after you know any relative, right? Is if you know the person best, you want to look after them. So I, I think, um, you know, in terms of team-based care, we need to think beyond. I, I don't disagree. We, it's a it's about a team-based approach in terms of healthcare providers, but it's also the the family and the supports around that person in the community are also part of the team. I love that we're having a complex conversation, but bringing it down to the level that are real life circumstances that people can understand. Uh, this next question hits home for me a little bit. This is for you, Dr. Arnold. Uh, my sister was having a conversation with a dear friend of hers in another province, albeit, but her friend's daughter is really struggling uh, with an eating disorder and uh, finding really challenges. Here's the question. Somebody in this room heard new funding was made available for beds to support adolescents with eating disorders. Are we meeting the demand, especially with the connection to youth mental health? Where are we at on that? No, that's a, a great question. Um, so, in fact, one of the um, I mentioned how during the pandemic we had an increase, sort of a global increase in mental health problems. One of the areas that was hardest hit, and for various reasons that maybe we don't fully understand, was eating disorders. So the, uh, the increase in prevalence and complexity and severity uh, of eating disorders just rose even relative to other mental health conditions. And one of the challenges with eating disorders in particular is the needs are complex because they're both um, certainly at the root of it, it's a mental health disorder, but of course there's physical needs because these are individuals who are in many cases, um, you know, starving themselves effectively, so they need that, um, talking about team-based care, they need that integrated care. In terms of whether we're meeting the need, I think, um, you know, having more beds is a step forward. Um, I don't think we are meeting the need, although I think that even more needs to be done at all the, you know, along the continuum all the way from kind of early intervention, prevention, all the way to when we have you know, the most acute situation where a young person you know, needs to be hospitalized for, for medical reasons as well as getting mental health support. So we're, I don't think we're, it, we have a ways to go. Um, you know, again, positive development, that, uh, the new beds, but a lot more needs to be done in that area. All right, this question is fascinating. It is directed at the doctors Aaron and Perry, but it could be picked up by anybody here. What role will AI have in the future of rural care, primary care, any of the care cycles that we're looking at, given HR constraints, and how will it improve patient experience? If anybody in this room has used chat GPT, it will replace the MC very quickly, but it might have a beneficial um, side too. How is it being used? How could it be used? Let's start with you, Aaron. Sure, so I'll, I'll talk about an example that one of, uh, one of our rural physicians who we work with closely in the educational space uses in terms of AI in their workplace. Um, because I think rural is a, is a place that's actually ripe for innovation. So anyone who's gone to the family doctor has unfortunately, or any doctor has unfortunately probably had the experience of having a computer set between them and the physician and someone having to type away madly while, they, while, while, they talk to, while you talk to your physician. Uh, or maybe someone like me who pecks away at the keyboard with one or two fingers. And for many years, the electronic medical record and the computer has been a barrier between 
the patient and the physician or the patient and the healthcare provider in terms of uh, making a connection and feeling understood. So in one of our rural clinics, they're now just now starting a trial of a product that's an AI listening tool that doesn't just do transcription of what the doctor and the patient says, but synthesizes it into a medical note. A medical note for the doctor that summarizes the visit and a medical note for the patient that gets emailed to them or printed to them that summarizes the visit. So instead of having to type, the computer sits on the side, listens, and does some th synthesis, maybe links to some best practices or some suggestions. And as the, as the physician uses this, the AI learns their preferences. They say, oh, they like the note organized in this way. And it's because it's a learning AI. And so examples like that are actually powerful examples where I think right now we're at a point in technology where we say sometimes technology gets in the way. It gets between that human to human, person to person connection. But I think AI is actually maybe the magic piece in this that will allow that technology to move from getting in between us to being a facilitator of connection. Great answer. Carrie, is, is AI, machine learning, those kind of things um, influencing your work and the conversations you're having with your peers? Um, so I love that example. I was going to say maybe they could make a note typing easier. I didn't realize there was an actual <laughs> listening device. Um, but you know, the other way, so beyond that individual uh, interaction with, a, with someone in the clinic, AI can also help support a lot of you know, what we call panel management and looking after population health. So if we have an electronic medical record that contains notes and diagnoses, et cetera, right now it's quite cumbersome to go through that and to identify you know, a, you know, a, a group of patients with diabetes, for example, and have they had, uh, you know, there, are they on the right you know, guideline recommended medications or have they had the tests that are recommended? It's actually because of the way we input data and have to comb through it, it's a bit of a cumbersome process. But integrating some of the AI technologies could make that a lot easier. Um, the, the AI can go through and identify things more accurately than we can and you know, present maybe you know, someone comes in then and your AI has done the job for you and says, oh, you know, this person is maybe behind on this screening test or something like that. So we can use it to manage our entire practices or even, say, at a network level to, to help to manage some of that as well. So. All right, thank you. Here's a, here's a question that's come up in a, in a few different ways. Um, it's a system levels question, but it's also the question everybody asks. Politicians will be asking it. You might be asking it at your door. Um, will more money, Dr. Tom Noseworthy, why don't you take this to start? Will more money solve Alberta's health care challenges? There's always this push and pull, well, if we just had more money, maybe we just need to spend the money differently. Where does money fit in to the challenges we've got? Is it the panacea, the magic bullet, or is it something more complex? Well, money is no holy grail, but without it, we would have difficulty, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. um, there's never been uh, a year... Um, where the Canadian healthcare system and Alberta's system has spent less <laughs> than the year before. Hmm. In fact, most year over year increases are well in excess of CPI. So all but about three or four years of the last 40 odd years of Medicare, uh, we go up every year. So it's never a question of losing, it's just how much will it go up. Um, I think that we've demonstrated that just simply adding more money doesn't get a desired effect, and yet that's what we usually do. Anytime, for instance, we have a waiting list, we usually just put more money in the supply side and just ramp up the number of cases without changing the way the cases are actually done. Uh, so um, my sense is that at, you know, I'm not sure where we are now, about 7,000 bucks a person, roughly, in Canada, that we're spending on health care. Um, I think we're adequately funded, and we're always in the top third of all the countries in the OECD. So compared to everybody else, we seem to be putting enough money in. We're tipping in over 11% of our GDP right now. Uh, we'll crowd out other things. We spend more. 
Uh, I think what's really important is get predictable funding. So the amount matters each year, but the predictability. But now look what just happened with the federal workers. Now 12% over the next four years, all the health unions, unions will be out, so we'll know what the cost and the inflation in the budget for Alberta Health Services is going to be by way of example. So any more money is never the solution, particularly when it's dealing with waiting lists. Not unless you restructure uh, the way the service is actually provided. That's your best shot at getting better value for the money. We should put a lid on the expansion every year that the system uh, is allowed to have. Hmm. And I would not allow it henceforth to increase more than CPI in any given year. Why? You want to give up education? Mm. Always trade-offs. Interesting. Um, Dr. Uh, Arno Paul, um, given the whole notion of ROI, uh, th these are always unfair questions, but I'll ask it. Where would you put more money into the system to give the, ba the greatest bang for the buck? There's always a bang for the buck. But in youth mental health, where would you focus the dollars if you had that, that piggy bank, if you had that pot of gold? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there needs to be, um, it kind of go, following on, I do think you know we do need more money, but I do think it can be used uh, relatively effectively and in, in, you know in different ways. So I think in terms of where the best bang for the buck, I do think we um, there are areas in which we'll need more acute care. So we talked about the area of eating disorders. So I think we'll still need to continue funding that and maybe providing more funding. However, I do think there's a great value in putting more funding more upstream. Uh, again, looking at um, improved and more effective er, uh, early interventions, um, which typically are interdisciplinary. We talked about team-based care, but may involve multiple disciplines. So it's not just, although, again, we're, you know, we, probably do, we probably don't have enough child and adolescent psychiatrists. That's not also going to answer the problem by just putting more of us in, in, uh, you know, into the system. I do think it needs to be interdisciplinary and, it, and needs to be more upstream, including, for example, places that we might think of as being traditionally outside of healthcare. So improving uh, services that are within schools, for example, um, where, again, many of many individuals prevent, present for the first time uh, with, with mental health concerns. All right. Um, everyone, that's Brenly. Uh, give us a wave, Brenly. Hey, Brenly, my um, cursor has disappeared, and I can't scroll up and down. So. She's going to solve for that while I uh, improvise. Um, I've actually got a, a question for Carrie. When it comes to primary care, I, I, I actually kind of like the question that, that was posed by somebody out here. Bang for buck, where is it? Is it on innovation? Is it on data? Is it on team? Like, where would you put it if, if you had that, 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 quick, that quick response? Where would the rapid response be and where would the sustained response be on primary care? Um. So <laughs> it's a tricky question. Uh, I think, you know, the where we are right now, we're not we're not going to recruit and retain enough family doctors to meet demand going forward. So I think we really do have to invest in team-based care and and create these create robust primary care teams that can take care of patients. Um, that has to be something that we do right away, and that will involve recruitment retention, but it also involves you know, uh, just making sure that uh, an entire robust team can be funded through our system. Uh, longer term, I think there's a lot to be gained from efficient data systems, um, and I think there's even more to be gained by going further upstream. Uh, Paul already alluded to this, you know, our, most of our health is determined not by our healthcare system, but by the social determinants of health. And, you know, we're, we're only going to help make our population healthier if we look at those, if we look at housing and education um, and providing basic income supports so that uh, we have less health disparities and hopefully people will need our system less. Jana, this question's for you, and it's a bit of a challenging one, and, and you can take a look at the premise and respond. Somebody in this room says, recent experience with an elderly relative shows that home care spends more energy assessing and other bureaucratic busy work, their words, rather than actual care. How can this waste be transformed into better care? Are we putting our emphasis in the wrong places? How would you react to that? So I don't work um, in a home care. I mean, there is a little bit of an assessment that will always be required, right, to figure out what the services are. Um, and I, 
you know, and I do applaud Alberta for actually having a whole network within acute care where they actually start that process while someone's still in acute care. I actually think that that's actually um, a, a good way to go. I, you know, um, I interesting that question because I, I would have thought the question would have been more the, the the feedback I get more is the the turnover of staff, right? So you have. Um, you know, you don't always have the same um, healthcare aid coming to to give. Um, you know that the care needed, and and that's usually what the feedback I get is that there wasn't consistency, particularly, um, you know, from from relatives that are looking after people that are living with dementia, right? Because consistency and and standards of of the same provider. Um, so, so without answering your question, probably what I actually would do is I think we need to look at pay equity across um, what, what we're paying people, right? So I actually think, um, uh, you know, and I, 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 the, the pandemic highlighted this, particularly in outbreaks in um, continuing care, but also somewhat in, in uh, home care, is a lot of health care aides are, are paid close to minimum wage, right? They're barely paid um, a living wage, which means they're working well beyond 1.0 FTE um, just, to, just to survive, right? And, and so there, um, so what we saw with with the COVID pandemic is we had healthcare aides that were working across facilities and probably also working within home care, and so we saw spread and outbreaks um, be because of that, right? And and it wasn't an easy solution. Um, so you know, to Carrie's point, um, I think decreasing um, disparities, which includes the the pay differential, you know, pay paying people that are working in home care better, um, they're more likely to. Um, to stay and get and get you know feel valued for what they do. Um, I can't really comment too much on the overvaluation though. Probably, probably some room for for improvement there. But but I think it's probably more just um, having consistent consistent care and um, uh, care you can rely on is is um, would be the priority I would say. Now the good news is we have dozens and dozens of questions from this crowd coming in. The bad news is we have eight minutes left. So I'm going to be selective. Uh, but this one's quite an interesting one. I, I run a small nonprofit. Unlike AHS, I have 14 bosses. So uh, when my board talks to me, they talk about, can you have all these great ideas? What are you going to stop doing? This questioner asks, what do new, uh, new, to, new, new, to do new things, we need to stop investing our time in some old things. What should we stop doing? I'm going to go to Tom, and then I'm going to go to Aaron on what, in your respective uh, ideas and disciplines, what should we stop doing? Tom? Get rid of low value care. <laughs> Could you be more specific, sir? Um, there's a lot of research from multiple different places that have lists of things that are of low value to patients and their outcomes. Um, in some places, there's success in dealing with those. Uh, but we still do too many tests. We do too much imaging. We order too many medications. Uh, and frankly, um, that's really bad in older folks. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot we could do, and we don't have to do one more piece of research to do better. Wow. Good. You're allowed to clap. That's allowed. <laughs> sure. Good answer. Uh, Aaron, what would you do less of so you could do more of something else? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, most of my answer was is actually the same as Tom's. We should really look at low value care and and some of that is is guideline based practice and standardization of common common issues um, and I think that that does a lot to eliminate cost I guess the other thing in rural is is always there's this idea of of knowing what the balancing metrics are and so um, sometimes we can do things that up front may appear to have a cost but it may actually save money when you look at things from a whole system point of view uh, and a good example of that that's been implemented in some other parts of the country, like in Quebec, is whether a hospital has imaging capability with ultrasound and a CT scanner. Um, there's lots of busy small hospitals in Alberta that spend a lot of money transporting people for various types of medical imaging. Uh, and whether the economics line up in those particular communities to say maybe it's actually cheaper to deliver the care locally in the community with a CT scanner or an ultrasound machine than to transport people back and forth and often in high acuity ambulances that leave the, the community, you know, they have downstream effects. The community maybe doesn't have an ambulance when, when that person is out of town getting their scan. So I think we can look at some of those balancing metrics as well in terms of helping us to decide what to stop. All right, we've got five minutes remaining. We're gonna do a whip around at the end. I'm going to give you a choice, panelists. You can answer one of two questions. Your choice, which one you want to answer. 
One of the questions that came in, what are you excited about in what's coming up in healthcare? The other question is, well, this is a, a, a very election ready one, if a politician of any stripe came to your door, what would you ask them? One of two questions. Carrie. Uh, so I'm going to take the first question. I knew you might. <laughs> um, and talk about what, what I'm excited about, right? That was the question. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, right now, it's, you know, especially with primary care, it's very top of mind. Uh, there's a lot of promised investment in primary care, and I think we have a really good opportunity to look at what's working and what's not working and do our you know, do what we can to um, spread the the innovations and the the practices that are really working well. It's right now uh, all the stars like, seem to be aligned for that, and I think it would be a real opportunity missed if we didn't do that. Good question. Uh, good answer, Aaron. Well, I guess I have to answer about the politician because <laughs> Carrie took the other question. A brave soul on the panel. I like. Um, it. So if a politician came to my door, and hopefully they will, because I think it's important that all of us talk with the people who are, who are um, running to represent us, what I'd ask them about is follow through. So I think lots of promises have been made about, about improving our healthcare system, and sometimes they seem scattered. We'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do this. And it's not necessarily clearly connected, and it's not necessarily clear to me how people will follow through. What's the commitment over the long term with these? Are these just flash in the pan initiatives or are these things that we're gonna we're gonna you know knuckle down on and really work at to make better? So so if a politician came to my door, I'd say convince me that the things that you're talking about in your campaign are initiatives for the long term. That they're things that matter to you and that your party will follow through on. All right. Paul um, yeah, no, I think I'll, maybe we'll alternate. Uh, but uh, so in terms of, um, you know, what I'm excited about, uh, I think what I'm excited about is that uh, we're sort of, we're at a time now where, although on the one hand, as I mentioned, there's a crisis in youth mental health, we have a community that I think that's really mobilized about doing something about mental health. Um, we have uh, evidence for some interventions that work. We need to know a lot more. Um, but we do have a, again, a, I think we have brought this issue out of the shadows. There's a, you know, I think that the population at, at large is much more engaged, <coughs> excited, interested in doing something about mental health. And I hope that gets, you know, again, gets reflected in um, how, you know, our governments respond uh, to the crisis. But uh, so that, that's what I'm excited about. I think it's a, um, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of promise, both based on the, the evidence that we have, the research we have, but also the, the way that the community is mobilizing around uh, helping these young people. Thanks, Paul. Tom, choose your own adventure, door number one or two. Well, I'm door two, the politician is there. I don't want to ask him anything. I want to perhaps suggest or tell him something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there, there, I, I see at least one in the crowd, so go ahead. Uh, well, with due respect, uh, every time you make a major structural change in the healthcare system, it, it takes a generation of, of the doctors, the nurses, and the patients to get over the impact, and the 208 one, came like in the middle of the night without warning. There was no big plan and poof, it happened. The 1995 one, at least we had a chance to think about it. So please, don't make a major structural disruption in the healthcare system when you first get in the office to be showy or be nice or whatever you're trying to do. Uh, if you're gonna make a change, do it thoughtfully and you've got to involve the public centrally in the change that they're, you're gonna make in their system. You're only passing through as an elected representative. You don't own the damn thing. <laughs> oh, I'm going to miss you when you actually retire, Tom. Uh, Jaina, take us home. Uh, so, so I'm going to go with the, pol the politician, too, and um, I do agree with what Tom said. But um, I, I would ask, you know, w what are they doing to prepare for the fact that our population is aging? This has been no surprise. We knew the population was aging for quite some time, and we've done nothing, um, right, uh, or very little. And to me, with the, the pandemic, the one thing that it, it highlighted very quickly was that we weren't ready for an aging population. And some of the outcomes we're seeing as a result of the uh, pandemic, I think it pushed our population, the things that we were going to see 
um, uh, quicker. So, you know, I, I'd want to know what, what are they going to do, not, not just in terms of healthcare, but what are they going to do in terms of supporting, you know, age-friendly universities so that people can go back and reskill because people will be working longer probably as our life, you know, our life expectancy is higher, realistically retiring at 65 is not going to be realistic. So how are we going to create, you know, um, age-friendly universities? How are we going to cr create age-friendly communities that are good for all of us? Um, you know, how are we going to integrate um, uh, an aging population, um, you know, a, a dynamic in, into society uh, in, an, in an effective way and, and encourage um, uh, meaningful, good quality of life throughout the lifespan? Um, and, and how are they going to tackle ageism, which is probably one of the sort of last remaining acceptable forms of discrimination we have, which um, is very um, concerning as our population ages. So, All right. Um, I, you can't see it, but Rochelle just held up a sign. It's bright red, and it says, time is up. <laughs> so, uh, doctors Jaina, Carrie, Aaron, Paul, and Tom, let's hear it for your panel. <laughs> I'll just end off to tell you what I'm excited about. I'm excited that a group of citizens showed up on a Tuesday night and took time away from their families and their hobbies, maybe this is your hobby, to have a conversation, a meaningful, nonpartisan, non-politicized conversation about health care. That's the sign of a healthy democracy. Give yourselves a round of applause. All right, thank you very much. Thank you to the O'Brien Institute for Public Health, the great team that put this all together. Dr. Stelfox for trusting me behind this microphone. And if you like what I did, my name is Ken Lee McQuello. If you really like what I did, tell Dr. Todd Anderson from the Cummings School of Medicine to give me an honorary degree. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>